Hello, today I'm here to do the first wrap up of the year. I'd like to briefly talk about the five books I read in January. The very first one I read was The Chimes by Anna Smail. This was long listed for the Man Booker in 2015, I believe, and is set in a dystopian London, in a world in which people don't fully form memories. And instead of that, the way of communicating is through music. And the author was actually a trained violinist, I believe, and that shows really strongly because instead of just moving quickly, people move presto or subito. So I thought that was really interesting. Music is um, shown really creatively in the language in the book, and also music has this special role in communication. So the people selling things in the market sing songs and people will sing songs to each other to remember directions to get to places. So I thought that was really, really interesting. We follow the main character in the beginning, Simon, I believe he was called, and we have a difficult time getting into the story initially because he also doesn't remember stuff. So we've, we've read things that happen and we all, almost only get flashes of what's happening right now. So it takes a while until we get into the story and there's a more coherent storyline, but it's really worth it once you get into it. There's also a really well told love story, I thought. A love story between two men unfolds and it's not cheesy and it's not political and it's not, oh my God, they're gay. It's just a really nice love story. I thought that was very special. So The Chimes, a bit of an unusual dystopian novel, which is fast paced and centers all around the magical qualities of music. Then I moved on to a slightly less cheery book. I read The Time in Between, A Memoir of Hunger and Hope. Yes, that's what it was called by Nancy Tucker. I gave this four out of five stars on Goodreads. The author Nancy Tucker tells the story of her struggle with anorexia throughout her childhood, teenage years, young adult life. Obviously this memoir is about an eating disorder, so this is not an easy topic. She talks about her eating disorder as an illness, an addiction, a coping mechanism. She reflects on the role her family life had, her relationships with her parents and her sister. Um, she also doesn't claim to be out of the woods and fully healed in the end. So this is a, a tough book to read because it is so personal. Nancy Tucker writes in a very reflective, self-aware manner, which is quite fascinating for someone talking about an illness that is so all-consuming. So I thought this was a very well-written memoir by such a young person. Obviously, if you have issues with reading something about someone who has an eating disorder because of your own struggle with this, this might be a difficult book to read. And interestingly, one of the most impactful parts of the book I thought was the foreword, which sounds really bad, but no, the foreword actually touches upon Nancy Tucker struggling with worrying that the book she was writing would trigger her readers and serve as somewhat of a how-to manual to anorexia. And she she desperately wants to avoid that. She, she doesn't mention numbers and she, she tries to not serve this sort of competition between people with eating disorders. I weigh less, I eat less, I exercise more, I suffer the most. Um, so I thought that was interesting as well, stepping back from just the book as such and thinking about the impact that such a book can have on impressionable readers. Then I moved on to the Sellout by Paul Beatty, which I also gave four out of five stars, which just shows how difficult that kind of grading is because these are vastly different books. The Sellout by Paul Beatty won the Man Booker Prize last year, and the narrator in this book grows up in a small town called Dickens, somewhere in California, and after the death of his sociologist professor dad, he sets upon quite literally wanting to put Dickens back on the map. and one of the ways in which he tries to do this is by reinstating segregation in this small town and he also happens to have his own slave. So this is a really bizarre premise and it deals with issues of race, obviously, 
but in such a clever and nuanced way it makes fun of racists, it makes fun of people who try to be politically correct about the topic, it is really free in how it chooses to deal with these questions, it has a really good cast of side characters, let me know which one is your favourite if you've read it, mine is the slave. I did have difficulties getting into it initially and that's also the reason why I also only gave it 4 out of 5 stars. I did not enjoy the beginning so much when it, it starts off talking about the relationship of the main character with his father, um, who is this um, professor, he's uh, an, an important character, personality within the community, and I just previous month had read the Dumb House by Burnside, which is also very popular, and these two books are nothing alike, I don't mean to say that, but the beginning shows this difficult relationship between father and son, and how the son becomes the uh, participant, unwilling participant in experiments, basically, by his dad, and that just reminded me too much of the Dumb House, wasn't new enough for me, and also in the beginning the chapters seem almost a bit like short stories in themselves, which some people I've talked to especially enjoyed. I just have a trouble with short stories, so after a few of those chapters I got more and more into it, because then you start to see the, sort of the storyline as a whole. I thought this was very, very well written and deserved to win the Man Booker Prize, so uh, I definitely recommend. Then I decided to move on to something which I expected would be quite a quick and easy read. I read The Rest of Us Just Live Here by Patrick Ness. I read his A Chaos Walking trilogy a few years back, and Patrick Ness obviously is a very popular writer in YA fiction. The Rest of Us Just Live Here centres around a group of teenagers, mainly main character Mikey, who is mainly just interested in finishing high school and asking his crush out. But every chapter begins with a short little story about the indie kids, which um, are those kids that always just happen to get involved with um, vampires and step into wars between gods, and that's normal in this universe. So there's these indie kids who are the cool kids, uh, who get mixed up in supernatural extra human stuff, and then there's Mikey and his friends who just try to be normal, and the idea I thought was really cool, the story, the book was sort of pegged as a sort of what happens with all just the normal folk where the superheroes are out there fighting our battles, um, and yeah, it, it was very fast-paced and I think Patrick Ness writes in a really fun way, um, but I thought the initial quirky idea fell a bit flat for me. It reads quite a bit like a sort of YA contemporary, and that's nice if you need something to just push you through because you want to read something fast, but read the Chaos Walking trilogy instead. I thought those characters were much more fleshed out, and you are really invested in those and don't care more about little side characters that um, never fully get touched upon. And then the last book I read this month was one that I loved. I read Brit Marie Was Here by Frederick Backman. This is the third of his books that I like. I, uh, yes, also the third of his books that I loved, the third book of his that I read. This centres around Brit Marie, a 63-year-old woman who, after her husband leaves her, ends up working for the first time properly in her life in a community centre in a small town called Borg. Um, she's this really rigid, uptight, unsociable woman, and we follow her and the array of characters in this small town, and the friendships that are formed, and it's a tale about being kind and friendship and choosing your own family initially. I thought it was so sweet. Um, the only reason I think I didn't give it 5 out of 5 stars was that the main character, Brit Marie, is already introduced in a previous book of his that I read. My grandmother apologises and sends her regards, and 
I had already grown to like her as a character by the end of that book and now with this book you sort of start at zero again which is great for people who choose to only read that book it's totally a standalone but I started reading the book, I was like, oh no, come on, but Marie, I already loved you, what are you doing? Why are you so unlikable now? But yeah, there are some very, very sweet moments in their great metaphors. So there's this whole spiel about how the football club that you support says something about you as a human, and I immediately did test that out on people, asking them what their favourite club was and what they thought that meant about them, said about them. Um, so really uh, a, a pick-me-up novel, not fluffy, like there are some serious topics in there. It seems to me that I will just like everything that Frederick Backman wrote. I think I still have one or two books of his to discover, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and it was a good month overall, really. Um, if you've read any of the five books and have drastically different opinions to me, or say yes, yes, they were great, I agree. Please let me know, I'd love to hear from you, and I'll see you again next month. Bye-bye.